Soccer in the US, it hasn't always had the best track record. Its popularity wavers and interest is usually tied to major events such as the World Cup or the Olympics. Major League Soccer has spent over 25 years trying to change soccer sentiment in the US while competing with more fast-paced, high-scoring sports like the NFL and NBA. You know, you could just tell that the players are better, that the speed of the game, um, you know, not being the, the biggest soccer fan, you could just look at it, it's night and day. You know, MLS, it looks like it's more minor league. It looks like it's growing. Uh, but, you know, listen, they have the signages all over the place, very innovative league the MLS is, but they got to improve that competition. Over the last 10 years, the MLS has become increasingly popular. The league garnered the attention of top talent across the world, brought in significant investments in celebrity ownership, and generated a massive presence on social media. Uh, we think the internet you know, puts us in a position where we can talk to this enormous fan base around the world. And what we've done over the past you know, 10 to 12 years is really uh, increase uh, the investment in making uh, the US and MLS one of the top leagues in the world. But the MLS's rise in popularity has seen its fair share of obstacles financial woes, leadership changes and shakeups, and its continuous fight to draw in a TV audience. Following its 2021 season, things may be shifting in the MLS's favor, with new expansion teams, rising popularity, and a new media deal that can bring millions of fans and billions in revenue. This is the largest sport in the world, and the U.S. is the largest sports economy in the world. And so there is something really special in the making here. Um, and it just requires steady investment, but you think about the ownership group in MLS and the amount of capital that's been invested, it's never going back. It's only going forward. Before the MLS became, well, the MLS, there was the North American Soccer League, which ran from 1968 to 1984, and it was considered the blueprint for what the MLS should and shouldn't do. The North American Soccer League was a free-spending, decentralized league meaning teams spent excessive money on star players like Pele to draw in fans. The league never generated meaningful revenues or substantial growth that it needed. By 1984, financial tolls from overspending cost the league almost all of its clubs as they began shuttering their franchises. In 1985, the North American Soccer League officially suspended operations. This is Jim Curtin. He's the head coach of the Philadelphia Union and has been with the MLS from the very beginning. You know, there was a time in the, the 70s and 80s that, you know, 75,000 people were coming out to watch soccer games, uh, the New York Cosmos as the, the kind of uh, example of that. Um, but what did happen is it was kind of a reckless spending. It was maybe too much too soon. Uh, there weren't um, the soccer specific stadiums that there are now. Um, and it was kind of like a traveling circus almost, almost, and it was a little bit out of control uh, and without a real kind of vision and, and longer term plan, I think the lessons learned were um, they got a little too big for themselves too quickly uh, and, and all of a sudden now the money dries up. By 1993, the new MLS League was announced with a centralized structure that controlled costs similar to the NFL. Clubs were split into divisions and run by investor operators or owners. Ten clubs were created for the initial debut in 1996 with two more clubs added just two years later. If I think back to when I first started in Major League Soccer in 2001 as a rookie, uh, we were playing games in uh, high school football stadiums in, in Dallas. We were playing in Division III colleges in, in Naperville. Early on, we were down to 10 teams. Um, there was real discussions in my rookie year in the offseason that the league might not make it. Uh, at the time, Phil Anschutz was in charge of an own seven of the teams, of the 10. Um, so it was on life support, uh, and, and Don Garber came in and injected this, this life into a, a league that was quite literally in trouble. The league was met with strong pushback during its early years. Traditional soccer fans were opposed to some of the rule changes and scoffed at the MLS's attempt to Americanize the sport. Then in 2002, and had to fold two teams, the Miami Fusion and Tampa Bay Mutiny. And what happened after that, and what was probably one of the most important things was the the, the building of the soccer-specific stadiums, you know, a, a real brick-and-mortar building that our, our, our supporters and fan bases could call their own. They weren't, you know, old college football stadiums or old NFL stadiums. They were soccer-specific. And, and now I think we're up to 27 of these state-of-the-art, you know, beautiful, 
um, you know, facilities that um, can, can house uh, you know, 30,000 people and in some cases down in Atlanta 50,000 people uh, at a game. So uh, that's something that we really, um, really was important and it was a real turning point. By 2007, things began to trend upward for the MLS with the establishment of the designated players rule. This rule allowed teams to sign star players from abroad. Most famously, the signing of David Beckham to the LA Galaxy with a deal that was worth $250 million. That rule certainly has paved the way and has been a smart initiative in that we grew the league in a, in a, in a smart way. It wasn't that you could have 10, of, 10 David Beckhams on your team where you know previously uh, in the former NASL, they maybe expanded too quickly um, um, with the way they strategically went about the designated player rule slash David Beckham rule um, was calculated and uh, it didn't put all your eggs in one basket. You know? So um, I think that was a really intelligent move that um, put our league uh, on the global uh, level because David was uh, you know, an icon uh, on and off the field. Early 2000s was really um, R&D, it's to figure out how, how do we attack this and I think the soccer specific stadiums, the designated player, all part of that R&D process to figure out how do you build a league uh, unique to our country, the playoff systems, the, the different formats. Um, when I got involved in sort of 07, 08, I saw, thought the next 10 to 15 years would be the investment phase where we grow from 15 teams to 30 plus, you know, 30 teams, um, cover the map much more uh, completely like other major sports. The MLS is focused on expanding its clubs to massive sports markets and increasing popularity with younger generations. For over 25 years, the MLS has grown into a massive operation. Clubs now span from coast to coast, with Austin FC debuting in 2021 and new clubs in 2022 and 2023 for the Charlotte Football Club and St. Louis City, respectively. You've seen the breakthroughs city by city, but uh, the critical mass of the league uh, really won't be apparent until we reach that sort of 30 team milestone. And it, it, and it you know, it is, sport is something that you enjoy together as a community, as a family, as intergenerationally. So uh, we're still building the storylines. We're still building the rivalries. We're still building the traditions. Um, and that's something that takes time. It will happen organically. It's not something we can naturally, unnaturally force. The clubs are becoming more valuable than ever. In 2008, the average valuation of MLS teams was about $37 million. Today, clubs are valued at $550 million, higher than some teams in the Premier League. Currently, the Los Angeles Football Club is the highest valued MLS team at $860 million. It's almost alarming to see some of the valuations of, of the teams in, M in Major League Soccer um, because you know, you, you think of um, some of the old English teams that have 100, 100 plus years of history or, or teams in, uh, in, in different parts of Europe that have been around forever. Um, but what you see now with, with our league is, is these brand new stadiums, um, these, these young, exciting ownership groups that are coming in, uh, the advertising dollars that come in, the amazing facilities, um, and they're really jumping in, in value uh, at, a, at a really quick, quick rate. Um, sometimes it's shocking for people to see that, uh, as an example, LAFC is valued at higher than a, even a club like Newcastle, who just had <laughs> basically trillionaires come in and buy it. You know? So it's incredible to see um, the growth of this league in 2018, Gallup issued a report that tied soccer and basketball for second in popularity for sports to watch among 18 and 34 year olds, overtaking baseball. When I walk my kids to school in Center City, Philadelphia and drop them off, um, I used to, 10 years ago, I used to only see NFL, NBA, you know, maybe a Major League Baseball, you know, a couple of hockey flyers jerseys. When I walk my kids to school now, it's not just Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo, I'm seeing Philadelphia Union jerseys, but then I'm also seeing now rivals of the Philadelphia Union. I'm seeing New York City FC jerseys. I'm seeing a Zlatan Ibrahimovic from the LA Galaxy jersey. I'm seeing a, you know, a throwback, you know, David Villa from New York City FC. And you're kind of going, this is different. And a study done in 2020 by Morning Consult found that soccer is the most popular sport among Generation Alpha. And the Los Angeles football club owner, Larry Berg, believes that the MLS could overtake Major League Baseball as America's number three sport in 10 years time. 
MLS still has to improve their product. They got to go out and get better players, right? And so if, again, if that soccer popularity continues to rise with Generation Z and then Generation Y, um, that's going to help the MLS, right? Or generation Alpha, Generation Z, generation, generation Alpha. If that soccer continues to, you know, that trajectory, that's only going to help the MLS. Again, how big, we don't know, because right now that popularity seems to be from the international standpoint. They like Premier League. They like to see the big stars. They, they, that competition is completely different from MLS. But before the MLS can attempt to overtake the MLB anytime soon, the league still needs to dominate in one crucial area, TV viewership. While the MLS's rapid growth has been able to overcome financial issues, fan pushback, and leadership shakeups, the one thing that has been slow to grow over the years is its television footprint. Media rights are a massive cornerstone to how a league functions and operational revenue. Just take the NFL for example, in 2020, the league made an estimated $9.89 billion from its media deal, which is evenly distributed amongst all 32 teams. This gives teams like the Green Bay Packers something called national revenue of $309 million for 2020. For the 2019-2020 fiscal year, during the pandemic, this national revenue helped teams stay afloat as most stadiums remained closed and teams were unable to generate local revenue or revenue from ticket sales, merchandise, or stadium rentals. For the Packers' 2019-2020 fiscal year, they were only able to generate $62 million in local revenue, compared to its 2018-2019 fiscal year, where it generated $211 million in local revenue. The MLS is a localized sport, meaning a massive amount of the team's revenue is generated from ticket sales, merchandise, and player contracts it sells to other leagues around the world. Media rights. I uh, keep harping on that, but that's going to be that's the foundation right now of all the leagues. The media rights, because in this age of content, 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 MLS is going to need that money to grow. Now they're going to need a network that's really going to invest in them, be able to tell their story, be able to introduce fans to their stars of the sport, being able to market their sport better so that people can gravitate. Because right now, a lot of people do not watch MLS from a national level. It's more of a localized market, right? This is why your Austin's and your Charlotte's. Hopefully, those two markets continue to rise, and that's going to help you know MLS grow but they need a national audience. The MLS is looking to establish a new media rights deal in 2022. The MLS's current eight-year media deal with ESPN, Fox, and Univision has generated an estimated $90 million per year since 2015. The league hopes that it can capitalize on the success from its younger fan base, social media presence, and the FIFA World Cup that's being hosted in the U.S. in 2026. I think the, the way we're going to broadcast to our fan base, um, you'll see another league sometime between now and 2026 in the way fans can participate and consume um, you know, the quality of play uh, and they'll see that uh, it is comparable to some of the uh, best, team, best leagues. If we continue to do the work that we're doing um, with the unique fan bases that we have, with the great ownership that we have, um, with the product on the field that's continuing to improve as the TV production gets better and better, um, I think that the, the sky's the limit for Major League Soccer.